good to be with y'all in the Lord's house this morning, this Advent morning. We are now in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to take this week and the next three weeks, all of Advent, to look at <coughs> the story of Christ's birth through the lens of the Virgin Mary. Through the lens of the Virgin Mary. And so this morning, uh, we're going to look at the Gospel according to St. Luke, starting chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you in the power of of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who has been called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of God that belongs to us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy, pleasing, and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, we come into what many call the greatest time of the year. But how many who say that are talking about Advent in particular? Advent comes from uh, the word uh, veni, or come, which, which means come. Think about an air vent. The, the air is coming through that vent. It's coming. So vent, come. Advent to come. We're in the season of Advent. It's a season of waiting, waiting for God to come. Now you might say, well, God already came uh, in, in Christ in the manger, and that's true. But it's also a season where we're waiting for the God who will come again. So God came, sending his son in the incarnation, his birth, his life, death, and resurrection. God will come again by sending his son at the end, as we say in the creed, to judge the quick and the dead. But he's also the one who comes right now. He comes right now. You know that? We're going to say in a few moments when we celebrate Holy Communion, we'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what we're saying is he's actually coming right here, 
right now, wherever the word is proclaimed, his praises are sung, and his meal is shared. He is coming now. And so we're in a season of waiting, a season of waiting. And if you look throughout Scripture, the whole Bible is a story of God's people waiting. God's people waiting. Ever since Adam and Eve left the garden, they, we have been waiting to return. We were able to return. We've been hearing echoes and whispers and seeing shadows of that garden and waiting to re-enter it. There's a story of a, a man who's in a grocery store having to learn some patience because his baby boy was crying so much. And so he just kept saying, Albert, it's okay. Albert, we're all right. Albert, it's going to be okay. Albert, calm down. And eventually, bit by bit, the baby gets quieter and quieter. It even comes to a hush. It goes to sleep. Well, there's a, a man nearby who's so impressed by this, comes over and, and says, Wow, I'm just so impressed how you were able to calm Albert down. Now he's sleeping. And the man said, I'm Albert. <laughs> Good morning. We're all waiting. We're all in need of patience. In a, in a world of smartphones and screens and internet, many of us are not trained in the way of waiting, in the way of patience. We are actually, it's not neutral. We're actually being trained actively in uh, instant gratification. We're actually being trained more and more out of patience, not in it. We're, we're being trained, if we're not careful, to be more and more impatient. More and more impatient. Here in our passage, we have the Virgin Mary, who is waiting. Who's waiting. Now, Pastor Stephen, how do we know she's waiting? Well, one of the things in Scripture, especially in this passage, is it's not only what's said, it's what's not said. It's what's in between the lines which is so fascinating. You see, um, in my cursory look, and I didn't do a thorough, exhaustive look, but in my cursory look throughout the, the Bible, I was seeing that the Virgin Mary is one of the only people in the Bible who, when an angel comes, and now I'm not talking about dreams, because Joseph, that angel came to dream, I'm not kind of dream, but when an angel comes, it doesn't say she's afraid. Now, if you look, depending on your Bible, it'll say she was troubled, um, it'll say she wondered, this is verse 29, she's greatly troubled, and she considered in her mind, my translation, some will say wondered, but it doesn't say she was afraid. Now, the angel reply, Gabriel says, don't be afraid, but it's interesting because almost everybody else, they're instantly afraid. Zechariah, just a couple verses before, the father of John the Baptist, it says <coughs> when the angel Gabriel came, he was afraid. And you know what word it uses? The word we get for phobia. He was phobic. He was phobic of the, from the angel. And he's a priest in the temple, for goodness sake. He should be prepared for an angel to come. He's not. And yet, Mary wonders, and she's confused or perplexed at what kind of greeting this might be. In other words, what's implied, we don't know this for sure, but it's interesting to think. I mean, her and Peter in the book of Acts are some of the only two who are not initially afraid when the angel comes. And so could it be that maybe she's not so much afraid of the angel, but she's confused and wondering, what is this angel getting on about, about this favor and this blessing? You see, so, so what is implied, which if you read between the lines, it could be, now it doesn't say it, but it could be, that maybe Mary's someone who's accustomed to encountering angels from time to time. She's not afraid, oh, here, here's, wow, an angel, I, I can't believe it, but why is he saying this? Why is he not doing the normal angel greeting? Hey, how are you? Why this one? You see. You see, so she, it, it's applied as someone who's very faithful. She's someone who's very faithful. She's waiting. Just like the people throughout the Old Testament are waiting and waiting and waiting for the Messiah to come. The Messiah is prophesied as early as Genesis 3. 
When is he going to come? They were waiting in Egypt for him to come. They were waiting in the wilderness for him to come. They were waiting in Israel, the promised land for him to come. They were waiting in Babylon for him to come. When is he going to come? And so Mary, uh, the Virgin Mary, is, is, is also caught up in this waiting. She also knows Scripture very well, as any young Jewish woman or, or boy uh, would at this time, because when the angel, so this is something I just learned this week, when, the, when Gabriel replies and says, your son, he's, he's going to be uh, called son of the most high, he's going to be, um, uh, he's going to have the throne of David, he's going to have the kingdom, and it's going to last forever. So son of the most high, throne, kingdom, lasts forever. Did you know all four of those are point for point? When God says to David in 2 Samuel 7, he says, look, David, you're going to have a son who, who he's going to have my throne. He's going to have it forever. He's going to be your son and will rule a kingdom. And that kingdom will last forever. All four points are in 2 Samuel 7. See, because when I read this passage before, I thought, okay, it's kind of redundant. Okay, kingdom and throne and forever, and all kind of kind of roughly mean the same thing. But the angels getting particular about a particular passage, prophecy in the Old Testament. But Mary, notice she doesn't say, hold on, what are you talking about? She knows exactly, exactly. She might only be 12, 13, 14 years old. She's got 2 Samuel 7 memorized upside down, backwards and forwards in her sleep. She knows. Her question isn't about that. It's, well, how? It's, well, how? So, so she knows her scriptures, and she appears to be someone who is not new to spiritual encounters, maybe even an encounter with an angel. So she's someone who is waiting. She's someone who's waiting. Now, this time of the year, there's, there's a word that we're going to hear a lot. We're going to hear it in the Psalms. We're going to hear it from uh, boys and girls or adults, and it's the word wish. Wish. What do you wish for this Christmas? I wish you a Merry Christmas. And so, and so we'll hear a lot about wishing, but you know, um, the spiritual writer, uh, Henry Nowen, he says that, see, in the Bible there's waiting, and waiting is very different from wishing. The waiting is very different from wishing. I heard this week, this is so sad that these kind of things happen. Uh, a pastor friend of mine uh, received an email, uh, an email prayer request, all right? Now, I mean, pastors see all kinds of things. And this email request said, could you pray for me? I'm looking for, there's a guy, you know, look, I'm, saying, I'm looking for a woman. Okay, all right. Where are we going? And then the person says, well, I want her to be such and such height. Not too tall, and maybe like five nine. And I want her to maybe have this color hair, and and, and I want her to be from this city, but not this one or this city. And even name a couple cities she might be from. Please pray for me. Thank you. Now that's a wish. That's not waiting for what God wants. That's not waiting on God's will. That's not like the Lord's prayer. Your your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's my will be done. That's a wish. It's a wish, but if we're honest, how many of us, come on now, good morning, myself included, our prayers are more like wishes. More like wishes. What's a wish? Well, a wish is what I want on my timetable in the way that I want it. Waiting is saying, God, it's on your timetable. God, it's whatever you want, and it's in whatever way. Now, how can we know, how can we test if a prayer we have, a petition, and we're asking God, how do we know if it's a wish or it's actually waiting? I think one of the main ways we can know is resentment or frustration. God, come on. You ain't, where's the Corvette? Come on. You see, when we don't, when it's a wish, we We'll get upset if we say, look, God, it's not on my time. You didn't bring it the timetable I thought it should. You didn't bring it the way I wanted it. Right? And so we do a lot of wishing 
And you know, it's not a bad thing to wish for a certain president in this season, but we're going to hear that word a lot. You see, because as we know, this season is about the greatest gift, the greatest presence ever given, and it's Christ Jesus, who is our Lord, who was born among us. He's the greatest gift. But here's the question we never think about in this season, is how do you receive that gift? How do you receive that gift? You know, pretty soon, I'm going to have to teach Isaac, probably in the next year, this is how you open a gift, and this is not how you open a gift. This is how you can be thankful, and this is how you can be Disgraceful, or whatever you want to call it. Now, when I was little, I would just rip the present open and, yes, or, ah, I don't know, I don't like it. You know, that's, that is so disgraceful. That is so uh, unkind. And yet, I, I did that. I remember one time my parents got me a really nice bike for my birthday, and immediately I said, I don't want it. I didn't even say thanks. I just said, I don't well, did you receive the gift? Well, yeah, I, I opened it. It's in my hands now. But did you really receive it? Well, no. Well, so how do you, okay, well, in this Christmas season, how do you receive Christ, who is the, the whole reason of this season, of the, the greatest gift ever given? How do you receive it? Well, you know, I think that the Virgin Mary here in this passage gives us an example. Now, as Protestants, sometimes we don't talk about her that much, and there's reasons for that. And I'm not saying she's perfect or sinless or anything, but that she is one of the best models we have for the Christian life. And she is one of the greatest models right here on how to receive Christ. Right? And so, and so she is waiting. She's not wishing. She's waiting. She's waiting for a promise that God has always promised. And he, God's always faithful to his promises. This waiting is actually active. It's not passive. A lot of times we think waiting is, is passive. It's just, it, well, just sit, sit back over here. You're in the DMV. Just sit over here and wait. But you see, in the Bible, it's more like hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. We got a job to do. Right? You're a son or daughter. You're to serve Christ and to serve the least and the last and the lost. And you're to be a shepherd. But you're waiting. So hurry up and wait. So Mary is hurrying up and waiting. Does that sound weird? It should. She's hurrying up and waiting. And waiting for God is also open-ended. And here's the one we don't like. Here's the one we don't like. God, I'm waiting for such and such to have your way. It's your way. It's your will. It's not mine. You know how dangerous the Lord's prayer is? We're going to pray in a moment. You know when, when Jesus taught that prayer, your will be done, what, did he, what does he pray in the garden later? Your will, not mine. How much did that cost him? Everything. How much would that prayer cost you? It cost you everything. And so she's waiting. <clears throat> She's waiting. Um, and so, as we see in this passage, not only is she waiting, she also, and this is this is amazing, she's wondering. She's filled with wonder. Verse 20, uh, 28, she was perplexed, and she wondered what kind of greeting this was. She was filled with wonder. In other words, she was surprised. In other words, she was surprised. You know, sometimes, I said this last week, if you want to hide something, put it in plain sight. You see this water bottle right here? Now you do. It's in plain sight. All right? There are so many things about the Christmas story that we don't even see, that we don't even realize, that we don't even internalize, because we it's been in plain sight our whole life. If this story doesn't surprise you and shock you again and again every year, then you might need to ask some questions. You know, and this is from a, another pastor, um, Tim Keller. He says, look, if you had, a, if you had like a third cousin who uh, you never met uh, him, and he died, and he had an inheritance of a billion dollars, and you got a knock on your door one day, and they said, hey, we just want you to know, you know, uh, John Schmidt, he died, and he has no relatives whatsoever, and so his inheritance is going to fall to you. We know you've never heard of him, but you're going to inherit $1 billion. 
Well, now you can respond a couple different ways. You can be absolutely amazed and surprised. Oh my goodness, how in the world? How could this happen? And where? And I, I need to hear the backstory. And I never would have thought. And I mean, are you serious? And really? And why? And what does this mean for my life? Well, everything's going to be upside down. Well, how am I going to figure out how to not be totally selfish? And I mean, I, I know there's stories about and people who win lotteries actually have a worse life, not better. So, I mean, what am I going to do? I mean, how am I going to steward this for the kingdom, not just for me, because everything's on loan anyway? But what? And I can, you can respond that way. Or you could respond and say, well, I kind of knew that something good in my life was going to happen. I'm not that surprised. I kind of knew everything was coming to me. Good stuff was coming to me. What in the world? You see, when, when we go through Christmas, when we hear these stories and we go, well, yeah. We're acting like the guy who says, man, yeah, I knew that something good would happen to me. Do you know that God himself, the infinite, became finally the most high? became the most low, the most powerful became the most weak in the form of a, a baby. Do you know that? It's going to fill us with surprise and wonder, just as Mary was filled with wonder. So first, uh, Mary shows us that to uh, open and receive the gift of Christmas, we are to wait, not wish, we're to wonder, not wander. And lastly, we are to welcome or surrender. We are to welcome or surrender. You see, at the end of this passage, uh, the Virgin Mary, she says, May it be to me as you have said. You know, behold, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Now, hold on one second. Hold on one second. All right. Think about other miraculous births in the Bible. All right. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. All right. You know, Samson. Okay. And, you know, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. Okay. Okay. But even Abraham and Sarah, they laugh at God. Not only that, before that, they say, well, God, I can't wait. Let's, Hagar, let, let's get another child in here. We have Hagar, and we, we, have, we can do this. They take it in their own hands. I'm not waiting on your time. Take why not? And even when God continues to say, I'm promising, I'm promising, I got a different timetable, they laugh at God. They laugh at the promise. That's what Isaac's name means. Now, here's the thing. For Abraham and Sarah, for them to have a child, everything will be better in their life. Everything will be better in their life. The, the community and the, the religious leaders, they would look at them as, as better. They're, they have God's blessing now, they would think. Okay? They, they would uh, now have someone to uh, uh, receive joy from. Of course, there's a lot of work. I'm learning a little bit about that right now. There'd be someone to hand over some of the responsibilities of the jobs to. I mean, the, their life was only going to get better from this birth, and yet they still laughed at God. But here's the difference. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Is for Mary, she didn't laugh at God. She didn't say, well, my way or the highway, I'm not waiting on your timetable. But here's the big thing. In her context, her life was not going to get better. Like Abraham and Sarah, for them to have a child, life would get better. Zachariah and Elizabeth, for them to have a child, their life would get better. For, for uh, Mary to have a child, life would get way, way, way worse. Why? Well, she's 12 or 13, maybe 14 years old. Engaged, but not married. So everyone would think she committed adultery. So she'd be cast out from her family. She'd be cast out from the community. She'd be cast out by the religious leaders. She's already not a citizen of the empire. She's not getting food stamps or any help. She's going to be on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. In the grind of poverty with little to no one to help because they think that she was an adulteress. Not only that, we find out next chapter in Luke chapter 2, what does Simeon in the temple prophesy over Mary? She pro uh, Simeon prophesies over uh, the, the child Jesus and then says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your heart also. See, here's a verse we don't think about that much. You see, Mary, your life's in the short term going to get way worse in, in worldly standards. And you're going to watch your son get beaten up, chewed up, whipped, mocked, 
and then eventually die the worst death that ever died. She was going to, in, in one perspective, have the worst life imaginable next to Christ who had the worst. But on another perspective, she was going to have a life more full of joy, more full of purpose, more full of hope than anyone else. Because she's waiting. She's not wishing. Because she's wondering. She's not distracted. Because she's surrendering. She's not withholding. She's not withholding. You know who's wishing and who's distracted and who's withholding? Cain. <laughs> you know who else is? Judas. All right, Jesus. Take out the Romans. Get your swords out. Let's behead some guys. Let's take them over and let's win this thing now. That's not how God rules, you see. That's not how God rules. And so this, this Advent season, may we learn what it means to wait. What it means to wait. What it means to have patience. Many have said that patience is the absolute foundation of our life of faith. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Right? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. People will know that we are Christians by our love, by our love, you know that song? But Christians, or people also know us by our patience. By our patience. Enduring whatever happens and receiving it as if from the hand of God himself and saying, well, I count it all uh, as a gift. I count everything that comes my way as a gift. How can I receive every single thing that comes my way as a gift? How? By the power of the Spirit. The same Spirit that overshadows Mary. The same Spirit that is overshadowing you right now as you gather, as we gather as the body of Christ. The very same Spirit that will overshadow these elements and overshadow us as we receive at his table. The very same Spirit that enlightened and filled Christ who is the light in the darkness. When I was like six years old, uh, growing up in Ohio, we always went skiing. And one year, I mean, every year the ski lift would stop working. And it would only stop for, you know, two minutes. And so you're used to it. So you're hanging up in the air on your ski lift, but then, okay, it keeps going, and now we're good. Well, one year, I'm on a really small ski lift. There's no safety bar. And I'm like seven years old, beside my mom. And it stops, and I'm really scared of heights. I still am. And so I was pretty terrified. We're 30 feet up in the air, no safety bar. And, and actually, when it stops, you're swinging. You're swinging because it's a jolt. And so we're there, and I'm thinking, okay, a minute or two, we'll be okay. It's, okay, now it's five minutes, and now the high schoolers behind us are laughing and, and, and being silly and saying, well, we're going to die. And now I'm feeling more scared. Okay, now it's 10 minutes, now it's 20. And then I see some of the people that work there with this little rope lasso and this little make makeshift seat. And they're going to throw it up and put us on a seat and pull us down. And I'm getting really, really, really terrified. And yet, I'm sitting right beside my mom. I'm sitting right beside the one that I know loves me. The one that I know will protect me. The one I know will guide me. The one I know will say it's going to be okay. And the one that when I say, well, how much longer? She says, just wait. We'll be okay. You see, that's, that's the way that Mary waits. She doesn't wait alone. You know, in this passage, if you read it, you'll see she, she probably is physically alone. But she's not spiritually alone. She knows that the Lord is with her. She knows that. She's always, I mean, imperfect though she was, she knew that. She knew that. And that is the type of way that he's calling us to as well. And so may we, like Mary, be filled 
with the outpouring, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, so that we, like her, might be a burning bush in a dark world, so that we, like her, might be like this tree shining with all beauty and all light received from above. And may we receive at this table bread from heaven so that we might be filled with the Spirit. Now let's stand and confess our faith together with the words of the